Radio 24, únicamente en i24 News. everyone, welcome to I-24 News. First, our headlines. No hostage deal yet. Hamas has not responded to the latest proposals. France, Jordan and Egypt call for a Gaza ceasefire with no plan to free the hostages. And Turkey starts a trade war with Israel. No hostage deal yet. Hamas has not responded to the latest proposal. I-24 News, Joe Brown has the latest. As Jews around the world make plans for Passover, the message out of Israel is clear. Let our people go. Today, I receive a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals. First and foremost, the release of all the hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. With pressure mounting on both Israel and Hamas to agree on a deal for both a release of hostages and a ceasefire in the war in Gaza, a new proposal was laid out by the US with conflicting reports on the outcome. One of the main sticking points is the number and profile of hostages Hamas is willing or able to release. The deal would involve 40 Israelis who are either elderly, sick or female in return for 700 Palestinian prisoners, including around 100 who are convicted of serious terror offences. But Hamas reportedly claims that it does not have that number of captives. This may lead to Israel having to release more prisoners in return for more men under the age of 50 and male soldiers to be freed. And this is not all that Israel must compromise on. An agreement has reportedly been made to allow a greater number of displaced Gazans to return north, moving to refugee camps rather than back to their homes. But there is still some distance between the sides on the length of the ceasefire. Israel looking for a pause of a couple of months in the fighting, Hamas pushing for a full IDF withdrawal from the enclave. Sources in Gaza have told I-24 News that whilst the political wing of Hamas is pushing for a deal, its military wing on the ground in Gaza wants to keep fighting. Some low-ranking Hamas officials claim that the group has outright rejected the American proposal, but the US and Qatar have both said that they are waiting for a response from both Israel and Hamas, with some signs of optimism after the slow progress in recent months. The Israeli Security Cabinet is convening on Tuesday, where it will decide if they can make a deal with the devil. Here in the studio with me are Major General Eitan Dangot and a veteran journalist Amir Oren. Thank you very much for uh, both of you. Help me out here. Uh, it's a lot of guesswork, but what do you think is the chance for a deal? Looks like last details. Well, I'm consistent. I failed every time I made this prediction, but I'm sticking to it. There will be a deal. Now, what is the Israeli position? It was never published. There has never been any official statement regarding the Israeli position. All we hear are media reports. And if you ask one of the people involved in the, the uh, hostage uh, deal, why don't you publish the uh, outline of the Israeli proposal so that the public will know, and if uh, Hamas is to blame, let us know it. And the answer was, we want to keep some negotiating space for the mediators so that they will be able to tell Hamas 
that they squeezed more out of the Israeli proposal than was originally presented. So this is very nice at the Harvard Business School or some other roundtable. But here people are losing their lives, and we should know what uh, are Israel's concessions, how far it is uh, really uh, willing to go. And uh, one of the uh, Hamas demands, at least, uh, to let uh, the uh, displaced persons be resettled in northern Gaza, at least to outside observers, seems logical. Why insist on it unless someone in Israel wants to stall? Or uh, maybe uh, Israel is afraid of Hamas going, getting back to uh, northern Gaza. I think that when you're talking about the north part of Gaza is the main important condition that Israel has in this kind of uh, tactic and operative details concerning the release of the hostages. Because the north part of Gaza is the main achievement that was done by the IDF. Empty zone, which was supposed to have there at uh, general life 1.5 million people. Now it's 200,000. You completely uh, control this area. And this was the mainstream of like the capital of Gaza for Hamas. And I think the movement of uh, the civilians back there should be very slow and under very clear conditions. Because we are talking now about the first shift. Remember, we are looking to get everybody. And they are looking to get their insurance to be covered by some thousands more till everything will be done. So I think that I'm not afraid from the fact that Israel is not publishing its conditions. I think it's right because you are in a very difficult situation compared to Hamas. Hamas is something very clear. We have something very, let's say, clear to achieve. But under the circumstances of the 7th of October, we are on a problem. And under such a thing, we have to do it under some conditions and not lose the opportunity to renew the fight. But if you ask me, my estimation that we will come to a deal just because United States is so far powerful in its, uh, uh, let's say, effort to achieve it. Uh, Amir, there are reports in Israeli media that, according to Hamas, uh, there are even less than 70 hostages alive. Does that make sense to you? Unfortunately, yes. Now, General Dangot knows more. He wouldn't share it with me. Um, but um, yes, um, sadly enough, uh, this is probably uh, right. And um, when they talk about 40 hostages in the next deal, and you uh, have to account for, let's say, 10 to 20 um, who are probably going to remain around Sinwar as his insurance, as his human shield, uh, there are not uh, many in between, the 40 and those right. 20. And therefore, uh, if you count Netanyahu's 64 fingers in the Knesset, there, there are probably more, or 72 with guns, more uh, than the number of, ho of hostages uh, still alive. Uh, and Dangot, without getting into details you cannot go into, uh, does this sound reasonable to you, to under 70 alive? I think that there are, let's say, some information about how many to estimate that are alive, and I think that the work that is done by the Israeli intelligence and the group that's responsible is very professional, and I think they are not surprised, but they will try to say that they will not be surprised. So, in my opinion, there are two main obstacles that are the main important in all this kind of deal. First of all, Hamas would like to achieve their victory as Israel stopped the war. Israel should demand all the people back because, I, in my feelings, after the first shift, if it will be done, we will have much more difficulties than now to renew the second part. So this is the main issues for this kind, what you can call a deal or not a deal. And by the way, during the last 72 hours, you see hundreds of uh, trucks, double container trucks, as we call it in our professional language, enter to Gaza, to the south, yeah, to the north. We'll, we'll have a but report I would like to later. say, well, there is no humanitarian break in Gaza from food and other things that are needed for the population. But you know, when Netanyahu says that the two components 
of um, his wish list are the return of the hostages, now he says first and foremost, this is novel, yeah. and total victory over Hamas. What does Sinwar here? Give us our hostages and then I'll kill you. Uh, it's contradictory. Yeah, well, I should remind uh, all of us that uh, there are like 133 uh, missing uh, people. If we were talking of 70 or under 70 alive, this is more than 60 dead. This is uh, it, it's, quite it insane. It means that almost 50 percent. But, but Israel wants its dead too uh, for yeah, burial. The deal. However, there's a delicate uh, situation here, because if Israel is willing to pay for a dead Israeli as much as for uh, an Israeli who is alive, there is no incentive for the captors to keep them alive. They may kill them because they know that they are going to get whatever they want the return, for the yeah. body. Well, that brings us to uh, the hostage families and their supporter, I-20, uh, supporters, R24 News, uh, Balir Sladin is with them uh, in Tel Aviv. Balir. Yes, so according to the uh, latest uh, Hamas official statement, they are saying that they are looking into the American proposal, but they are saying that uh, apparently this proposal doesn't give answers to their demands. So uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal reported uh, the aspects of this uh, uh, American proposal. We're talking about uh, six weeks of truce between Israel and Hamas uh, that includes the release of 40 hostages in exchange for 900 Palestinian prisoners and also includes the return of the Gazans, the displaced Gazans that went to Rafa uh, to their homes in the north, uh, uh, about 150,000 of uh, them. So the main points of disagreements here are concerning specifically the issue of the return of the Gazans to the north of uh, Gaza. So Hamas doesn't want Israel to be involved in monitoring or examining these Palestinians uh, who are who is uh, armed and who's not. Uh, uh, and they are also demanding that the Israeli soldiers uh, retreat from the buffer zone between the north and the south of Gaza. And they are also demanding that uh, these Palestinians back to their homes and not to some humanitarian zone where they will be living in tents. Uh, that's the main points of disagreement. But another issue is apparently uh, uh, going to be uh, some of the uh, main uh, disagreements or uh, main obstacles to this deal. Uh, the issue of uh, the apparent uh, uh, um, picture that uh, Hamas are saying that they have less than 70 hostages alive. So if we are looking into the first stage of this deal where these 40 hostages will be released, maybe Hamas doesn't even have 40 hostages that are in the category of the humanitarian category. So the elderly, the women, the children, and the wounded. So maybe Hamas, uh, that, uh, maybe Hamas uh, doesn't have enough of these uh, uh, hostages as the first category say. So they will uh, be uh, uh, adding uh, from other categories such as the Israeli soldiers. And if we talk about Israeli soldiers, then we won't be talking about only the release of uh, tens of uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners. We might be talking about hundreds and even more of that. So we might be talking about a huge or a bigger deal than what we thought uh, in the first stage. Thousands of Palestinian prisoners to be released for that specific stage. That's something, of course, the government, the Israeli government, after, Hama, after uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's vows that there wouldn't be a release of any uh, thousands of Palestinian prisoners will deal with, of course, and we will see which developments are going to be happening in the coming days. Right. Balir Saldin in Tel Aviv, thank you very much. So Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu keeps talking about their Rafah operation while most of Israeli soldiers pulled out of Gaza. I-24 News' Robert Swift reports. A date for the invasion of Rafah is marked in Israel's calendar. The last major Gazan stronghold still standing, Israel says an operation in the southern city is required to destroy four remaining Hamas formations. We will complete the elimination of the Hamas battalions, including in Rafah. There is no force in the world that will stop us. There are many forces trying to stop us, but they will not help it, because this enemy, after what it has done, will not do it again. It won't exist either. When the operation will launch is unclear. Prime Minister Netanyahu has previously announced his authorization for such a move on four other occasions in the last two months. Israel's allies, 
even the US, are publicly opposed to an invasion of Rafah, fearing intolerable numbers of civilian casualties if it takes place. Around a million displaced people have fled there, sheltering as Ramadan ends. Close to the Egyptian border, food is easier to come by in Rafah than in Gaza's north. Nowadays, there is no joy in Eid al-Fitr because we've been displaced from our homes and we have family members martyred, including Hussein, Khaled, and my family remains in Gaza City. Like the civilians, Hamas's leadership and their hostages have likely been pushed into Rafah, Israel believes. Seizing them will achieve the nation's stated war aims. But Jerusalem made similar arguments prior to its entry into Khan Yunus, Hamas's heartland. After a four-month operation there, Israeli troops withdrew, having won on the battlefield, but leaving behind a rubbleized city and an active Hamas insurgency, and having not located any living hostages or senior Hamas commanders. If a Rafah operation takes place, will it be different? The end of the line for Hamas? Or will Israel find itself once again chasing after ghosts? Back to the studio, uh, Amir, uh, Secretary Blinken just said uh, a minute ago that the United States has uh, no idea about a date uh, that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was talking about. How much of this is for internal consumption, really? Whose? Ours yeah. or theirs? Well, uh, there is a new application um, on the uh, store. Uh, it's called BB Meter. Uh, not uh, uh, different than uh, Google Translate. You put into it what Bankvir threatened in the morning and Smotrich warned uh, in the afternoon, and you get what Netanyahu will say in the evening. Because they, the two ministers, the two right-wing ministers, said that there will be no government if the Rafa operation is cancelled, um, Netanyahu came up uh, with this uh, ridiculous uh, remark that there is a set uh, date. How, how can it be? Um, do we have, much like Independence Day and Passover, another uh, day on the calendar, the Rafa day? Uh, it's really impossible because circumstances are changing. Hamas is changing uh, its disposition. Maybe if there is a political decision, maybe uh, an opportunity will arise uh, intelligence-wise, operationally-wise, to do it earlier or later. Uh, yes, um, to your direct question, yes, it's for internal, not only domestic, but internal government consumption. Uh, Eitan Dangot, is Rafah really the key to destroying Hamas? Rafah is not the key to say we completely the mission and we achieve the goal. Rafah is a part of the program to destroy and to break the structure of Hamas as, a, let's say, organized organization, which has battalions and brigades, etc. This is the last brigade. It's a part of the program, besides the fact that, of course, Rafah itself has a very importance uh, by being near the Egypt, near the crossing point, and while you control in this area, you are making a line to stop smuggling, etc. But I would like to add another thing. I agreed with Amir concerning the fact that any kind of uh, saying about or statement by the prime minister is something entirely. But pay attention to the fact that the United States is reacting in the last 48 hours twice to such a statement immediately, not less than one, two hours, that it's come to tell him two things. First, you didn't give up any date. Secondly, your delegation that's supposed to come here to sit with us about the program on Rafah has not even packed their suitcases mm. yeah. to go to the aircraft. It's, point, it's pointless. Get to this. Why, why should he say Rafah? Say we are going to find Sinwar and the hostages. Why put a geographic title on it? As you said, it's internal consumption. Uh, let me bring in I-24 News, Ariel Osaran, uh, standing by in southern Israel. Ariel. Yes, Jacob, with, as you described, only one division left 
operating inside the Gaza Strip. The ground operation is pretty much done. The forces are standing on the Netzarim uh, corridor, that's the area in the central Gaza Strip that splits it into it, it, north and south. But besides that, there aren't any maneuvering forces. And uh, as, as this is taking place, there's negotiations in Cairo and the statements of uh, Blinken that you just mentioned in studio. But at the end of the day, the, the fighting currently inside the Gaza Strip is pretty much at a standstill, despite uh, the occasional artillery shelling or airstrike that we can hear or that the IDF uh, releases statements about. But as far as the, the fighting, the, the ground war in the Gaza Strip, that's at a complete standstill at this point, with anticipation for this operation in Rafah. Right. Uh, Ariel Sran, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and this, in a joint op-ed for the Washington Post, leaders of uh, France, Egypt and Jordan are calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and a path to two-state solution for Palestinians. We have uh, Gerard Vespierre with us from Paris. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, this Hello. is uh, exactly what is being negotiated now. So. What is the point of this op-ed? Can you explain? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, Egypt is really playing a crucial role there as, first of all, uh, uh, as a threefold, if you want. First fold is that Egypt is a uh, border country to Israel and then has all the problems, the population, the supply. Secondly, uh, they are active in the uh, humanitarian support and cer certainly they are uh, supporting the uh, today negotiation between Israel, Hamas and Qatar. So uh, it's, Egypt is really on the front row in that article to my point of view. And uh, uh, France is uh, accompanying that strategy uh, with their presence in Lebanon, with their presence offshore. We have been uh, uh, using one of our aircraft carrier or helicopter carrier to support the uh, the people in, in Gaza. So there is that uh, common goal to support the uh, negotiation which are running today in Cairo. Uh, well, this is a pretty much one-sided uh, thing aimed at Israel. There's no plan for releasing the hostages uh, there, um, and I'm. Um, I'm wondering why would France side with Jordan and Egypt and not try to uh, go uh, into a, a, a more full solution here? Well, you know, those who have the solutions in their hands, they are Israel, the Hamas, and Qatar. Uh, so these are the, the three uh, which are now around the table in Cairo. Uh, the other nations around the world, including the U.S., are contributors to that situation. Uh, those who are making the decision uh, to free the hostage, uh, to free uh, people who are in jail in Israel, they, those are the Hamas and Israel. So those are the countries right now around the negotiation table in Cairo. All right. Uh, Gérard Vespierre, thank you very much for that. Let me add that uh, there's another statement by Defense Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin, who says there's no evidence for a genocide by Israel in Gaza. Why does he have to say that at all? Because he was probably asked, or the um, uh, pro-Palestinian, those uh, who are, do not uh, see the distinction between being for Palestinians and for Hamas, they have been attacking President Biden politically from the left in Michigan and other places. And Austin, uh, who is also uh, quite favored by the Afro-American community, as is General Brown, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he uh, came out probably, uh, he was asked by Biden's uh, people to, to say it. And indeed, there has been no genocide by Israel. This is just uh, one of the battle cries of the anti-Israelis. Meanwhile, uh, humanitarian aid is flowing to Gaza like never before, but mostly into the wrong hands. I-24 News, Nicole Sedek has more. 
more aid than ever before is entering the Gaza Strip. The coordination of government activities in the territories, Kogat, says 419 trucks of aid entered on Monday. But the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says it's still not enough. And when you put up statistics with numbers of trucks going in, saying, look at all these hundreds of trucks going in, and you put it against, look how few trucks have actually moved around with, the dis with distribution. <laughs> well, it's kind of an own goal, isn't it? Because half of the convoys that we were trying to send to the north with food were denied by the very same Israeli authority. Israel says it's inspecting aid trucks faster than the UN can deliver them. But many aid organizations argue it's difficult to quickly and safely deliver aid throughout the Gaza Strip, pointing to the deadly incident where the Israeli army accidentally killed seven aid workers. We will continue taking immediate actions to ensure that more is done to protect humanitarian aid workers. This incident was a grave mistake. Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. Israel has since said it will open the Ashdod port in southern Israel to receive aid deliveries, as well as the northern Erez border crossing to allow trucks into Gaza, in addition to the Karim Shalom and Rafah crossing. But when exactly is still unclear. The announcement by the Israeli government to finally open Erez border crossing and Ashdod harbor to aid shipments must be implemented quickly now. These are important steps for which we stood up for months and it's good that they are being taken now. But, as already mentioned, there must be no more excuses. As international forces pressure Israel to increase aid by land and sea, more aid is also flying in. The Jordanian army said it carried out the largest airdrop operation to date on Tuesday, with 14 separate drops. Still, the United Nations fears of famine if aid isn't smoothly delivered, even as the largest amount of aid enters Gaza since the start of the war. I'm going to go back to you, uh, Eitan Dangot. So that means Israel is back to supplying aid to Gaza. Israel opened some crossing to Gaza. The main is coming from Rafah still, but the checking done by Israel. Israel opened few places that were closed. I may say that for now, the south area of Gaza, Rafah, Hanunas is controlling still by Hamas, but the north part, the central by Israel, and we can do it, uh, control it. And I think that the number of trucks has been multiplied and more in the last 72 hours. That means that, in my opinion, we will not see any kind of problem for the future. And you have the mechanism by yourself how to do it in the coming days. All right, thank you very much for that. We'll take a short break and uh, we'll be right back with uh, more special coverage in our I-24 News. In a moment. Israel is in a state of war. Families completely gunned down in their beds. We have no idea where is she as our soldiers are fighting on the front lines. But the general perception is something that certainly needs to, to be fought as well.
Esta semana en News 24, Israel bajo ataque. News 24 en español trae el análisis y la información de los acontecimientos de la guerra, espadas de hierro. Entrevistas exclusivas, reportes desde la zona de guerra, la reacción de los países hispanoparlantes. News 24, el único medio en español que te mantiene informado y conectado con la comunidad latina en Israel. News 24, únicamente en i24 News. Welcome back. For the first time, a ship-mounted version of the Iron Dome missile defense system intercepted a drone that entered Israeli airspace. I-24 News, Dick Shuarvind has more on that. For the first time, an unmanned aerial vehicle, which was approaching Israel's southern city of Eilat, was successfully downed by the Israeli Defense Forces over the Red Sea. The drone was intercepted by a new system, the Sea Dome. Launched from the Israeli Navy, Sa'ar 6 class Corvette missile ship. The defense establishment continues all the time to upgrade the capabilities of the Iron Dome system on land and at sea in order to increase its effectiveness. In the current campaign, we successfully tested additional new capabilities for the system in its naval configuration on board the Sa'ar 6 ship, along with other layers of the multi layered defense system layer of the State of Israel. Eilat has faced repeated ballistic missiles from the Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen as an act of solidarity with Hamas. Houthis have also launched a series of attacks targeting shipping in the Red Sea since the inception of Israel's operation in Gaza. Following the start of Israel's offensive in Gaza, Israel deployed missile boats in the Red Sea, one of which used the Sea Dome to intercept the drone. The Sea Dome uses the same interceptor as the land-based Iron Dome system, both engineered by the Israeli Defense Forces contractor Rafael. Using the same capabilities, linking the ship's systems to the systems on the land and the radar that was developed specifically for the task of protecting the economic waters, the system successfully identified the threats, rockets, UAVs and cruise missiles, and launched towards them from the heart of the sea, naval Iron Dome interceptors that destroyed them with perfect precision. The integration of the Sea Dome in tandem with the Aero, the aerial anti-missile system and the Iron Dome ensures Israel's comprehensive defense system across all domains, land, sea, and air. So, Major General Eitan Dangot here in the studio, that adds another dimension to Israeli defense. Yes, absolutely. It's expand the capacity and the preparations and the readiness of, as it was said here in the movie, on the ground, on the air, from the sea. And also you can make it on the way, even before it comes to the Israel, like for the batteries that are deployed on the ground. What does it mean? You are going on the depths of the Red Sea. So you can achieve the target on the way while it's making is two-thirds on its way, and etc. So what does it mean? A great operational achievement on making technology all over the platforms that we are needed it, and it makes the strongness, I think, a situation of the Israel air defense system in these days in order to prevent any kind of attack that is coming from outside. Yeah, see, don't. Um, I'm glad to uh, welcome here Catherine perez Shakdam. Thank you very much for coming. Thank uh, you here in person, not on remote uh, interview. Uh, and we're going to talk about Iran mostly. Uh, can the Iranian regime afford not to react after what happened in Damascus? This is not a question of whether or not they can afford to not retaliate. I think it's a matter of um, being able to, to, to win something. Uh, and, I, and I think that Khamenei's regime is so very terrified. They, they're sitting on the, at the very edge of a cliff. They can't afford to lose anything. They can't afford to make a mistake. Um, they are hated within. Uh, they can't afford to lose any more IHGC, uh, whether they are officers or, or soldiers on the ground. They can't afford to lose anymore uh, because they can't replace them. So there's a very difficult choice. And, and I think that they're starting to understand that they, they stepped outside 
um, not the comfort zone, but they, they really drew outside the line when they, the way that the, they encouraged Hamas to attack Israel on October 7th. And they did not, I think, expect the, the level of retaliation and the way that the government and the Israeli and the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora in general, was going to react and how we united. Whether people agree on politics is, is beside the point, is that the Jewish people are one. And this terrified the regime in Iran. They understand that when we're together, there's nothing that could actually touch us or harm us and that we will move as one. And they can't do this. So it's not a question of can they or should they, it's that they, they technically cannot. And also, um, I don't think that Israel is, is uh, the immediate target of the regime. I think that the regime is trying to lock Saudi Arabia out uh, geographically, as well as Israel. And in order to do this, they need to attack Jordan. And Jordan is very much the target, which I think we actually stopped by targeting the RGC commander in Syria. And I think that they understand that the message was very clear, that we know exactly what they're up to, what they're doing, what they want to achieve, and that they're going to be stopped at every corner, every step of the way. So, so if anything, they are Jordan scared. The target? Jordan is the Hashemite kingdom. So from a very Shia theological perspective, it has to fall in order for the RSGC, the regime in Iran, to be able to geographically create this, this one corridor, to be able to link the entire region, to lock Israel out, and to lock Saudi out and to isolate the kingdom. You need to understand that this is, this is a battle that has, it's a form of colonialism, a theological colonialism. They're trying to rebrand the region to their colors. And they have already rebranded Shia Islam. They're trying to do this with Sunni Islam. If you look at the way that things have happened, Arab blood has been spilled in the street. Not Iranian blood, not RSGC blood, Arab blood. And the problem is the Arab streets, the Arab capitals are not realizing that they actually are being colonized by the RSGC. Syria was taken over, Yemen was taken over, Iraq was taken over, Lebanon was taken over. To a greater extent, Palestinians' identity was actually, they were branded by the RSGC and they're playing Hamas's game, dying for Hamas, for the RSGC. If anything, I would say that the streets need to wake up and understand that Israel is not the enemy, the Jews are not the enemy. If anything, we are the solution. We already, you know, decolonize ourselves. You know, we reclaim our territory, we decolonize ourselves mentally, psychologically. Um, we own ourselves and our identity and our history. They do not. And maybe it is time for them to wake up. We're coming to Passover. And I say, let my people go. And in that case, maybe they need to let their people go and understand that the real enemy is sitting in Tehran, not in Israel. If the uh, American grand plan uh, mm -hmm. really goes into effect and happens, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and normalization and all of that, um, where would, would that leave Iran? Well, it would leave Iran somewhere as long as the regime is, is, is out and gone and, and disappeared. The, the regime is this, you know, this construct that is essentially an enactment of slavery. It owns people, it wants to brand people to a very particular ideology, leaving no room for innovation, no room for freedom, no room for people to grow and move and change their mind. This is, this is a dead regime in the sense that you cannot, it does not accept life, in, in the sense that you can't have innovation, people cannot thrive, they cannot grow, they cannot travel out of the country, they cannot you know, even change their religion and change their mind. This is, this is a very antiquated way of living. This is, Feudalism at its very worst. It's the negation of humanity. It's nihilism. Um, <clears throat> and it cannot stand. And it, it will run out its courts. I mean, we, we have seen, you know, in history, ideology fall and rise. And this one will fall. Um, unfortunately, I think for the Iranian people, um, they, they're going to need to make it fall a lot faster um, because they're prolonging the enslavement. And at some point, something has to give. But it needs to come from within. We can't help them. They have to help themselves and understand. And I would say the same thing for, for the entire region. They need to understand that while they're hating us, they're actually playing the game of the properties in, in, in Tehran, not understanding, but hating us is the easy way because this is something that they know so well. But actually, while they're doing so, they're not hating the right people. They're not hating the right enemy. And I want them to get angry. It's just not at us because we don't want anything from them. They need something from us because we've already done the work. So my, my advice to them and my encouragement to them is just understand that the enemy is in Tehran. Wake up and actually, if, if not for yourself, for your children. Because who are you as a parent? Who are you as a person? If you cannot actually want something better for your child, the notion of martyrdom is, is the negation of, 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 of being a parent. If you're a mother or a father, why would you want your child to suffer for what? So you could achieve something? And who is there to verify it? Nobody. So I'd rather, I'd rather live a good life and actually stand for the truth. All right, Catherine, thank you very much. You're welcome.
And meanwhile, Turkey and Israel are threatening each other with trade boycotts. The Turkish foreign minister started yesterday. Night One for News, Arya Levin Waldman reports. Turkey, one of Hamas's key allies and one of Israel's biggest trade partners, has just cut off most exports to Israel. Turkey says the embargo will cover 54 categories of goods, including concrete, steel and fuel, and says it's because Israel refused to let it carry out airdrops into Gaza. There is no excuse for Israel to block our attempt to airlift aid to the starving people of Gaza. Faced with this situation, we decided to take a series of new measures against Israel. These measures, approved by our president, will be implemented step by step without delay. Relations between the two countries have withered since the war with Hamas began after the terrorist slaughter of Israeli border communities on October 7th. But until now, trade hadn't been touched. Turkey is Israel's fifth biggest trade partner, exporting more than $7 billion worth of goods to Israel annually. Raw materials such as iron, steel and plastics taking up the majority of the list. But the reasoning may be more political than diplomatic. Erdogan's party just lost a sweeping series of local elections because his traditional Islamist voter base didn't turn out. Many cited continued trade with Israel as the cause. Turkey maintains the embargo will continue as long as Israel fights in Gaza. But as many Israelis have abandoned Turkish products amidst souring relations, it's unlikely to ever recover. Now we have with us Dr. Chai Tanko and Yanurchak. Thank you very much for coming. An Thank expert you. on Turkey. Maybe you can understand what's the point of all of this. Look, this is a very complicated uh, decision. Um, you know, I was expecting to see such a drastic move maybe before the elections, but after the elections, many people can un understand the rationale, uh, the rationale after this uh, decision. Uh, this is very controversial. but. Again, I would like to uh, divert your attention to the Turkish politics once again. Uh, at the end of the elections, Erdogan was devastated. He saw that uh, uh, the Republican People's Party, the secular party, did manage to penetrate into central Anatolian region. But uh, what made him uh, really upset was the new welfare party. The new welfare party, this Islamist party, uh, they brought uh, a very important precondition to make an, uh, a, a, an alliance for the elections uh, with Mr. Erdogan, and that was uh, stopping uh, this, uh, putting an end uh, to the uh, bilateral trade relations with the state of Israel. Then Erdogan uh, didn't answer in a positive manner. But now uh, we understand that uh, he uh, basically surrendered. Uh, two days ago, there was a very important demonstration in the city uh, of Istanbul, uh, Istanbul's Taksim Square. Uh, there, uh, the pro-Palestinian demonstrators uh, that were driven by the Felicity Party, the, the Future Party, and the New Welfare Party, uh, they uh, confronted with the Turkish police, and the Turkish police oppressed them. And uh, the day after, uh, the uh, Turkish Islamist press attacked uh, Erdogan in a very dramatic manner. And uh, then we saw this, um, it's, it's a, like an excuse, it's a facade, uh, the, uh, the, the statement that was uh, carried out, that was delivered by the uh, Turkish uh, foreign minister. In my opinion, it's, a, it's an excuse, and this is very much related with the uh, Turkish uh, domestic politics. Now, as, as we know, uh, there are no winners in trade wars, but who's yeah. going to lose more? Uh, according to the figures, uh, the Turkish exports to Israel last year stood for $5.4 billion. And um, since uh, the most important, uh, uh, the most important uh, product, uh, from my understanding, is the steel. And uh, last year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, more than a million tons uh, of steel were dispatched from Turkey to Israel. So, you know, you do not have to become an economist to understand who will be the, you know, who will be the big loser of this decision. Uh, it's a, you know, uh, if we are speaking uh, in uh, the terminology of soccer, it's an own goal uh, for the Turkish economy because, you know, in the life, unfortunately, everyone is replaceable. And uh, the state of Israel will get uh, necessary decisions to replace Turkey with another supplier. And let me uh, make it very clear that uh, these products are not uh, ordinary products. You know, uh, these are strategic products uh, that are uh, 
very much related to the homeland security. We are talking about the construction sector. We are talking about cement. We are talking about aluminium and uh, and many others. Uh, so um, this is something very crucial. And once uh, Israel will replace Turkey with another supplier, even if Turkey will change its mind, uh, it would be very, very late uh, because at the end, uh, since we are suffering from this mistrust, it would be very hard to mend this bridge once again. And if you allow me, if we are talking about bridges, yeah. last week, uh, the Turkish Airlines uh, declared that they are not going to renew their flights uh, between Tel Aviv and so Istanbul. So no if we do not have people-to-people -people relations. No people, yeah. uh, no trade. Indeed. Uh, what, what's next? Maybe cutting off relations? Unfortunately, uh, you know, I really do not wish that we will uh, come to that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the Turkish... Uh, IHH, uh, the, uh, the organization that was declared by Israel as a terrorist organization. The Marmara. Uh, the Mar the, the yeah. organizers of the Mavi Marmara Flotilla, they announced that they uh, bought three different uh, ships that will sail to Gaza uh, on 15th of April. So next week uh, we may uh, see once again another unprecedented friction that may result in uh, the uh, you know the end uh, of the israeli turkish relations unless uh, you know um, uh, an adult like the united states will intervene and uh, will stop this uh, you know escalating situation because you know we are uh, we are not heading uh, towards uh, you know bright days unfortunately yeah it doesn't look good yeah, so again, not at all yeah thank you very much for your insight thank you very much for having me thank you now uh, a couple of moves by the iraqi government sending fuel to gaza and building a pipeline to turkey so with us now is uh, Intifad Kanbar, uh, president and founder of Kurdish Protection Action Committee. Thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, w what's behind these uh, moves, decisions by the Iraqi government? It's, it shows you the, the, uh, how chaotic the politics of the Iraqi government now. It's worth underlining, uh, Jacob, that today is 21 years since the uh, US, brave U.S. soldiers liberated Baghdad from the worst and heinous dictators in history, uh, Saddam Hussein. And also a few days before the expected visit by the Prime Minister of Iraq, last night, on this occasion, five attacks by cruise missiles were launched from Iraq to, uh, to Israel. This is exactly what's the problem. I mean, in the meantime, the Iraqi government cutting off funding for the Kurdish government, banning the Kurdish government from uh, exporting oil while we're sending uh, fuel products to Gaza, where we have a humanitarian and huge crisis in Kurdistan for lack of salaries and uh, no oil export, uh, while at the same time we are attacking another country, which is uh, a, a, a sovereign country, Israel, a member of the United Nations. Uh, at the same time, the United States inviting the prime minister, who is either complicit or, or graciously covering up for this mess in Iraq. I'm just wondering, does, does Iraq have enough oil to spread around like this? Actually not. We are importing our oil products uh, from abroad. And believe it or not, we have a massive uh, new refinery in Karbala, another one in Beji, and the militias and the corruption in the government prohibiting these uh, 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 refineries from uh, working and producing so they can import from Iran and benefit Iran. And then they, they, they hand it to Gaza. Well, I'm completely not against any humanitarian help, but we have a humanitarian crisis inside Iraq. The Kurdish people has been deprived of uh, more than 75% of their resources. And as I said, they have prevented Kurdistan from exporting oil through Turkey, which are, they are shooting themselves in the foot because the Iraqi government itself is, uh, is, is losing a billion dollar a year from the lack of export of Kurdistan oil. Uh, but they do it because of chauvinism and because of Iranian incitement. Antifat Kanbar, thank you very much.
Back to the studio here with um, Amir Oren and Eitan Dango. The, the question of Iraq, that was a kind of a wild card. I mean, we know Hamas and Hezbollah and whatnot, but suddenly uh, you have uh, planes coming and, and missiles out of Iraq. That, that's a surprise, wasn't it? Yes, Iraq uh, should have been a buffer state between Israel and its arch enemy, Iran. But because uh, Iraq uh, has fallen under Iranian auspices, it's only a launching pad or a transit station. Or this uh, uh, particular region, uh, Qaim, El Qaim in Iraq, or uh, Bukamal on the Syrian Iraqi uh, border, these are the very places where SCAD missiles were launched from in 1991. And, uh, and this is the same place the United States invaded, and look where we are now. Yeah, so we are going to make a living off this problem for many years. <laughs> Probably. I may tell you it's a kind of uh, looking that how Iran organized its uh, regional terror against Israel. It's a part, but I think it's a minor, a minor uh, item for looking at it as a major threat to Israel. What really bothers me, we have just started to talk about it with the lady that's been there here. It's about Jordan. When you are looking, if I may say, it, instead of Iranian uh, uh, and uh, Hezbollah, who organize this kind of circle around Israel, I think they identified that it's not enough for them. And they will make a lot of efforts in order to create in Jordan a new base, which will make from Roshanikra till Eilat, one area against Israel, and it means they also identify the weakness of Jordan, the type of population there, while they're already working and entering to Jordan, smuggling arms and uh, other kind of things, and people will have to organize. I'm not talking about tomorrow, not about one year from now. I'm talking about the coming five years, while we have to see how this region will take a part, and without press steps in order to understand that Jordan is the goalkeeper for all this area of the Middle East. I think things has to be changed by Arab modern countries, United States, and Israel as well to support and to prevent, because this will be a, a, a really a great adventure. Jordan is at risk? Yes, it is. Um, uh, first of all, there is a Palestinian uh, majority there. The pop majority of the population um, on the East Bank is Palestinian. It's uh, pro-Hamas, not only anti-Israel. And you know, the Israeli embassy in Amman doesn't really work. Um, it's closed all, on weekdays. Um, on Mondays, there is a convoy from Jerusalem with only the essential staffers coming back on Thursday night. It's a very cold piece. Now, fortunately, the security organizations and the military are cooperating with their Israeli counterparts. But on the political level, Netanyahu personally is uh, held uh, in suspicion by uh, the royal court because of uh, various uh, events uh, throughout uh, the years. So uh, we have uh, to bless our Jordanian uh, friends for helping uh, secure our eastern border. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, you have to say uh, Ramadan uh, is going by quite quietly, as opposed to some uh, very bad fears. That's true. Uh, sometimes um, the pessimistic uh, prophecies do not uh, come true. And um, one, again, has to credit the Palestinian population uh, on the West Bank, because they have not responded to incitement. Uh, they uh, have done their own calculus, decided that this is not the time, these are not the methods, and uh, we can uh, now have a sigh of relief. Uh, and this now, Bahrain's king has uh, pardoned nearly 1,600 people uh, facing criminal and riot charges. It's the largest such uh, mass release in years. Bastien Bury is with us now from Dubai. Bastien, uh, why now? Well, it's a sort of um, tradition at the end of Ramadan, but we have to say that a lot of these prisoners uh, had actually been on a hunger strike for quite some time, um, uh, refusing food in protest at their detention conditions. Uh, we're many talking about prisoners of conscience, 
many of them being dissidents detained during the 2011 sorry uh, crackdown on, on shiite uh, led protests which were part of as you know the arab spring when pro democracy um, protests uh, against the ruling al khalifa family in in bahrain uh, swept the country more than uh, 10 years ago now uh, a few detainees had begun refusing food last summer and increasing numbers uh, have joined since and some former inmates have said it was one of the most powerful strikes that has ever happened inside the Bahraini prison system. It has even triggered uh, rare street protests by relatives of inmates demanding their, their release. So uh, Ramadan tradition, yes, but it's, it's also a way of maintaining social peace in Bahrain. What do we know about conditions in uh, prisoners in Bahrain? Uh, well, as you, know, as you know, Bahrain is, is a tiny country, uh, but it has one of the highest uh, incarceration rates per capita in the whole Middle East. Around 4,000 people are behind bars, of which around uh, 1,200 are prisoners of conscience who are detained because uh, of their religious and political views or their uh, sexual orientation. And these prisoners are housed in uh, separate blocks and subjected to harsh treatment and this is according to former inmates and some organizations like uh, human rights watch who continuously ask for their release based on the fact that a political prisoner has to be pardoned uh, at some point and the government gives them anything else uh, besides uh, pardon um, if we're talking about the ones who are still detained, uh, their demands are for increased time outside their cells, uh, currently limited to one hour a day, uh, prayers in congregation um, at the, the prison mosque, also changes to constraints on family visits, improvements to education facilities and access to proper medical care. So the Ministry of Interior said it would increase the duration of visitations and was looking to increase the time inmates are allowed outdoors. but. You know, Jacob, that's pretty much it. And there's the story of a 62-year-old Bahraini human rights defender who has been in prison for 12 years. A few days after he joined the strike, uh, he was rushed to the intensive care unit of a hospital with serious cardiac problems. And according to some reports, uh, uh, he remained for a long time in need of urgent medical care, which prison authorities were, were uh, pretty much failing to provide. Okay, Bastien Bure in Dubai, thank you very much. Good evening. This is it uh, for us here in the studio. Stay tuned for more news with Kalev Ben David. Have a good night from Tel Aviv.
Israel is in a state of war. Families completely gunned down in their beds. We have no idea where is she. As our soldiers are fighting on the front line, but the general perception is something that certainly needs to, to be fought as well. Esta semana en News 24, Israel bajo ataque. News 24 en español trae el análisis y la información de los acontecimientos de la guerra, espadas de hierro. Entrevistas exclusivas, reportes desde la zona de guerra, la reacción de los países hispanoparlantes. News 24, el único medio en español que te mantiene informado y conectado con la comunidad latina en Israel. News 24, únicamente en i24 News. Welcome to this special broadcast on I-24 News. I'm Caleb Ben David. It is day 186 of Israel's war against Hamas. Now, the Security Cabinet is convening this evening amid conflicting reports over progress in the Cairo talks towards a new hostage deal. Also on the agenda will be the timing of an IDF offensive into Rafah, the last Hamas stronghold in Gaza. This after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he has circled the date on the calendar to begin that operation. Those two issues have now become intertwined, a point of contention within Netanyahu's coalition. Joe Brown has more in this report on the prospects for an agreement that would bring some of the hostages home and provide a break in the battle over Gaza. As Jews around the world make plans for Passover, the message out of Israel is clear. Let our people go. Today, I receive a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals. First and foremost, the release of all the hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. With pressure mounting on both Israel and Hamas to agree on a deal for both a release of hostages and a ceasefire in the war in Gaza, a new proposal was laid out by the US with conflicting reports on the outcome. One of the main sticking points is the number and profile of hostages Hamas is willing or able to release. The deal would involve 40 Israelis who are either elderly, sick or female in return for 700 Palestinian prisoners, including around 100 who are convicted of serious terror offences. But Hamas reportedly claims that it does not have that number of captives. This may lead to Israel having to release more prisoners in return for more men under the age of 50 and male soldiers to be freed. And this is not all that Israel must compromise on. An agreement has reportedly been made to allow a greater number of displaced Gazans to return north, moving to refugee camps rather than back to their homes. But there is still some distance between the sides on the length of the ceasefire. Israel looking for a pause of a couple of months in the fighting, Hamas pushing for a full IDF withdrawal from the enclave. Sources in Gaza have told I-24 News that whilst the political wing of Hamas is pushing for a deal, its military wing on the ground in Gaza wants to keep fighting. Some low-ranking Hamas officials claim that the group has outright rejected the American proposal, but the US and Qatar have both said that they are waiting for a response from both Israel and Hamas, with some signs of optimism after the slow progress in recent months. The Israeli security cabinet is convening on Tuesday, where it will decide if they can make a deal with the devil. 
Uh, for more, let's go to our correspondent, Balir Sladini. He's out in Hostage Square there in Tel Aviv, opposite IDF headquarters. And Balir, it's got to be a tough day for the families of the hostages. Some of these reports coming out, concern over those hostages, which we call the humanitarian hostages, the women, children, elderly, disturbing reports. And, of course, the security cabinet meeting, dissension within the government over how to proceed. Yes, exactly. After uh, a repeated request from uh, Smotrich yesterday, the far-right politician in Netanyahu's coalition, uh, the cabinet is now meeting in uh, Jerusalem to discuss the latest about this deal. And in front of the prime minister's residence, there are tens of uh, protesters, including some of the families of the hostages that demand a deal as soon as possible. They are saying that uh, uh, we are reaching Passover, the uh, holiday of freedom, as it's uh, uh, portrayed, and uh, we need to see our hostages is freed from Gaza and back to their homes. So, uh, of course, lots of tension, especially because of this conflicting reports lately. But we can talk about what we know maybe for sure. First of all, Anthony Blinken, uh, an hour ago, is saying, the Secretary of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Foreign Secretary of the United States is saying that we proposed a serious proposal for Hamas and this, uh, and if Hamas cares about the Palestinian people in Gaza, they need to accept this proposal. He is uh, also ruling out any operation in Rafah this week. Uh, so until there are more talks about an operation in Rafah with the Israelis next week, there will be no operation in Rafah, uh, just uh, as uh, uh, Anthony Blinken is saying right now. This is very important, of course, because as soon as we see an operation in Rafah, especially if it's before any deal uh, reached between the two parties, that means that maybe uh, we are talking about uh, deadlock in these talks after all. So the Wall Street Journal is saying today that uh, a truce of six weeks are uh, in uh, uh, these talks right now, 40 hostages, but the main points of disagreements are again the return of the Palestinians from south of Gaza to the north of Gaza. Hamas wants this to be unconditional. They want no Israeli soldiers in the buffer zone. No one explains who is armed and who's not armed. That's something, of course, is very tough for Israel to accept. And they are also demanding that these people go back to their homes and not to any humanitarian zone and uh, to any tents after all. And the huge issue right now that we understand, and also it has been stated in the report, that we're talking about a small number of uh, hostages that are alive, so less than 70. And maybe in this category, the humanitarian category that we're talking about, maybe less than 40 that are alive. That means that more on uh, the uh, category of the uh, Israeli male soldiers would be in the first stage. And that means that we will see, or at least Hamas will demand, thousands of Palestinian prisoners to be released of the jail from the Israeli jails, something that Netanyahu vowed over and over again before that it will not happen. There will be no end of the war and there will be no release of thousands of uh, Palestinian prisoners. Now we need to see whether this cabinet with Smotrich and Begvir in it can accept such terms in this deal as it's proposed from uh, uh, the U.S. All right, Balia Sladin there in uh, Hostage Square in Tel Aviv. Thank you for that. And we have with us, uh, as guests, uh, retired IDF Colonel Dr. Jacques Neri. He's the former deputy head of assessment for Israeli military intelligence, was a, an advisor to the late Yitzhak Rabin, and uh, Ambassador Danny A. Alone, former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. and former Israeli deputy foreign minister, now chairman of Silver Road Capital. Uh, Jacques, first of all, let's pick up some of the points that were made by Belir. From a security standpoint, could Israel uh, agree to see uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of these Palestinian refugees who went down south go back in the north, facing the danger of Hamas re-infiltrating in the north, retaking over that territory. Uh, I think that uh, we should not uh, look at uh, that uh, possibilities as a very dangerous one. I mean, after, after all, Hamas has been beaten. Out of the 24 the battalions, 19 have been elimin eliminated. And if there's a presence there, there's a sporadic presence in the north and uh, uh, in the south. And uh, uh, But let us remember that we have created the buffer zone between uh, between Gaza and the, the, the Israeli localities around Gaza. We have cut Gaza into two. And I think that uh, we have made some uh, accomplishment that uh, right now Hamas would like to eliminate. It, it wants to, uh, to return to point zero from the very beginning. Right. Eliminating all what we have accomplished during the, those six months. And this is a situation that Israel cannot accept. 
So after all, I mean, the, the, what sort of government uh, would we would we have to the, in front of us if those accomplishments would be just right. eliminated uh, and forgotten? Right. So the, the, this is this is one point, and uh, the, the the most important one is that Israel cannot. I mean, this is the only card. The fact that the the, the return of the refugees or the, the displaced from the south south to the north, this is the only card that remains in the hands of Israel in order to uh, some leverage on on Hamas, because otherwise. There's no military campaign. I mean, right. the, the military campaign is at zero right now. We are trampling on the spot. We are doing nothing. I mean, we just withdrew from uh, from uh, most of the uh, Gaza Strip, as the American had asked us. We are in phase three of the operation. The, but there are still some targeted killings taking targeted place, kill, as we yeah, just but saw. This is, so. But this is not a war. We are not at mm, war. Right. We are we are in a campaign. We are operations. This is commando operation. So the, there's the, the only leverage that the real le 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 leverage we we have on Hamas is the population, the Palestinian po population, and this is, I mean, th this is the, the, the fact that Israel has accepted the return of 2,000 right. per day, right. and the Americans are asking for 6,000. Right. Now, even if we accept 6,000, it means that it will take more than a year for all those right, of course. to return. And if this is the going to, this is the lapse of time. So when are we going to take care of, uh, uh, of, Rafa. of Rafa? Right, and uh, reports of, of tens of thousands of tents being ordered, and so exactly. they have to arrive. Uh, Danny, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this evening in a very difficult uh, place. Uh, on one hand, uh, as we heard, internal opposition uh, in his uh, cabinet, uh, in his government, to uh, either the, both the terms of the of a hostage deal and the delaying, that the, even accepting that would mean delaying the Rafah operation, something that could lead to a breakup of his coalition. On the other hand, these reports that we've just talked about, about the hostages being uh, the numbers that may have uh, died in captivity, is going to put even more pressure, public pressure, and say, now is the time where there are still some alive. Prime Minister Netanyahu in a no-win situation here, kind of. No, but I think one bright spot for him is that uh, the Americans now uh, have claimed uh, publicly that uh, it is Hamas now right. to answer for, for the deal. So this is kind of alleviate some of the pressure on Israel and on the Israeli government. Right, internationally. Internationally. On the other hand, um, he has this political pressure from Ben Greer and uh, Smotrich on the deal itself. Uh, nothing is, uh, is being, uh, you know, not, no deal is uh, done until everything is uh, agreed upon. And here, I think he will have a lot of convincing to do with Ben Greer and Smotrich about the number of uh, Palestinian terrorist prisoners uh, released, the identity of them, and um, that could be a, a very, very tough. Uh, right, because uh, as Jacques uh, said, if uh, well, said, if, if now we're talking about releasing either soldiers or people who are serving the IDF or younger uh, we, younger uh, hostages, we, the they're going to demand, uh, the Hamas thousands, will demand, the uh, 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 and higher ranking yeah. security prisoners. Right. And, and also, you know, once you do it in stages, uh, the Hamas can, can really uh, still hold all the cards. Would have been much better to have one, uh, one uh, type of a deal where right. everyone for everyone. But Hamas understands that this is the lifeline of Hamas to keep the hostages as long as possible in order to deflect any possibility of a Rafa operation, in order to tire uh, uh, Israel uh, up. And so far, it seems like they have all the time in the world. Time so far has been proven to work for Hamas yeah, in right. terms of the cards lost by Israel. Right. It's certainly, it's certainly well, why, in should, why should they be, be under pressure? Well, we've heard that. We've heard, that, as we heard, uh, uh, sources in Gaza have told I-24 News, the military wing, president Gaza is the one delaying it. They believe they have time. On uh, This yeah. is a period when they have. All right. It's a tough, uh, certainly a tough period now. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Prime Minister Netanyahu did say that a date for the launch of an IDF operation into the southern Gazan city of Rafah is now set at least on his calendar. Now, that declaration comes amid heightened diplomatic pressure on Israel regarding its conduct of the war in the Gaza Strip and domestic political pushback on the premier personally, as we just spoke about, regarding his war strategy. Our Robert Swift takes a closer look. A date for the invasion of Rafah is marked in Israel's calendar. The last major Gazan stronghold still standing, Israel says an operation in the southern city is required to destroy four remaining Hamas formations. We will complete the elimination of the Hamas battalions, including in Rafah. There is no force in the world that will stop us. There are many forces trying to stop us, but they will not help it, because this enemy 
after what it was done, will not do it again. It won't exist either. When the operation will launch is unclear. Prime Minister Netanyahu has previously announced his authorization for such a move on four other occasions in the last two months. Israel's allies, even the US, are publicly opposed to an invasion of Rafah, fearing intolerable numbers of civilian casualties if it takes place. Around a million displaced people have fled there, sheltering as Ramadan ends. Close to the Egyptian border, food is easier to come by in Rafah than in Gaza's north. Nowadays, there is no joy in Eid al-Fitr because we've been displaced from our homes and we have family members martyred, including Hussein, Khaled, and my family remains in Gaza City. Like the civilians, Hamas's leadership and their hostages have likely been pushed into Rafah, Israel believes. Seizing them will achieve the nation's stated war aims. But Jerusalem made similar arguments prior to its entry into Khan Yunus, Hamas's heartland. After a four-month operation there, Israeli troops withdrew, having won on the battlefield, but leaving behind a rubbleized city and an active Hamas insurgency, and having not located any living hostages or senior Hamas commanders. If a Rafah operation takes place, will it be different? The end of the line for Hamas? Or will Israel find itself once again chasing after ghosts? Well, for more, let's go down now to Ariel Osser on our Middle East correspondent who's on the Israel-Gaza border this evening. And Ariel, everyone's looking towards a Rafah, or at least they're talking about it. But as we discussed in the studio, we have a lot of questions remaining about when even such an operation would be ready to begin, given all the factors involved. Look, the Rafa operation can happen tomorrow, it can happen in two months, but the situation currently inside the Gaza Strip is that there are no maneuvering troops on the ground. You do have a division and a uh, brigade uh, in the central axis, the uh, Netzarim axis that splits the Gaza Strip into two halves, northern and south. But other than that, there are not any um, man large-scale military maneuvering going on. And that uh, indicates as to also the stalling nature of the war. But throughout the day uh, the, and, and night here, we could hear continuous artillery shelling. We could see air strikes. And even an hour ago, there was a rocket that was intercepted in Faraza, which is not too far from where we're standing right now. So while the the war inside the Gaza Strip is pretty much at a standstill with talks about Rafah, with the border communities on the other side of the border in southern Israel starting to get back to normal, it still happens. And the, with the sound of the booms, you can even hear firefights in the streets. Uh, rocket fire continues. So uh, I don't think we should focus only on the situation in Rafah, but if this is what the day after the war in Gaza will look like, I'm not sure that's uh, exactly what Israel uh, went up for with this war, and if it indeed will be the complete annihilation of Hamas as, be as is being promised. All right. Well, that's certainly the big question. Uh, uh, Ariel Osran there on the Israel-Gaza border. Thank you for that. The conduct of the IDF Operation Gaza has now become intertwined, of course, with the humanitarian aid issue. Now, the largest number of aid trucks entered the Gaza Strip this week since the start of the war, yet the U.N. says it is still not enough. Amid mounting international criticism of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, more countries are putting pressure on Israel to increase aid deliveries. Nicole Sedek has more on the latest developments on the humanitarian front. More aid than ever before is entering the Gaza Strip. The coordination of government activities in the territories, Kogat, says 419 trucks of aid entered on Monday. But the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says it's still not enough. And when you put up statistics with numbers of trucks going in, saying, look at all these hundreds of trucks going in, and you put it against Look how few trucks have actually moved around with the dis with distribution. <laughs> well, it's kind of an own goal, isn't it? Because half of the convoys that we were trying to send to the north with food were denied by the very same Israeli authority. Israel says it's inspecting aid trucks faster than the UN can deliver them. 
but many aid organizations argue it's difficult to quickly and safely deliver aid throughout the Gaza Strip, pointing to the deadly incident where the Israeli army accidentally killed seven aid workers. We will continue taking immediate actions to ensure that more is done to protect humanitarian aid workers. This incident was a grave mistake. Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. Israel has since said it will open the Ashdod port in southern Israel to receive aid deliveries, as well as the northern Erez border crossing to allow trucks into Gaza, in addition to the Karim Shalom and Rafah crossing. But when exactly is still unclear. The announcement by the Israeli government to finally open Erez border crossing and Ashdod harbor to aid shipments must be implemented quickly now. These are important steps for which we stood up for months and it's good that they are being taken now. But, as already mentioned, there must be no more excuses. As international forces pressure Israel to increase aid by land and sea, more aid is also flying in. The Jordanian army said it carried out the largest airdrop operation to date on Tuesday, with 14 separate drops. Still, the United Nations fears of famine if aid isn't smoothly delivered, even as the largest amount of aid enters Gaza since the start of the war. Let's talk about, for example, steps like opening the Erez crossing, uh, uh, which had been closed since a lot of it was destroyed on October 7th, Jacques. How quickly can the IDF, Kogat, which must be the, the, uh, Israel, the Israeli branch of the defense ministry that deals with civil issues, must be very overstretched right now to very quickly meet up these demands? I mean, I think that these demands can be met immediately. It's imminent. I mean, there, there's no real problem in, uh, in letting this humanitarian aid cross into Gaza because the first check is done at the port of Ashdod. So the yeah, security checks are done there. So the, what is left is lo only logistics, and logistics can be solved immediately. But there are security problems with uh, security with, with Hamas. Who, with Hamas, who would accompany the, 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 right. the convoys. And in in fact, till now, in the northern part of uh, of Gaza, the security is provided by Israel. By, by Israel. Now, the moment it goes into Gaza, and the moment it gets to the distribution, Israel has lost control. It's no more there. And uh, the the one who controls are the international agencies or the aid agencies at the United States and at the other co coalition and uh, and uh, must most probably you know no Hamas uh, operatives are there so the because as uh, the uh, as Ariel Osran said earlier there's no Israeli troops inside Gaza the only troops are on the uh, on the on the axis right. that, that cuts Gaza into two uh, otherwise we have left Gaza so this is why I'm saying what sort of campaign what sort of war are we having today with Hamas we have no war with Hamas no war is being conducted, right. and and this is the situation. And if the, if so, we should have understood from the very beginning that the humanitarian aid was the card that we should have played in order for us to continue the campaign. And we have been stubborn, and we just opposed every every measure that the Americans asked, and we are still opposing. The fact that we didn't offer a, a solution for the day after, well, we find ourselves right. out of Gaza and there's nobody well, to replace. But I just, Danny, there's a, a, it's a political problem for, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, but also among members of the public who have uh, said, who have protested some members, uh, certainly uh, from some of the more right wing parties or their supporters at the Ashdod port at that aid going in, saying we should not be sending humanitarian aid in while our, the, our, the host, Israeli hostages are uh, not getting any. As far as we, we we don't know if they're getting any kind of aid. Yeah, well, we have lost that uh, argument uh, altogether by not really initiating, not being ahead of the curve. And at this point, uh, all we have left uh, as a leverage over Hamas, of course, is the uh, uh, transportation or moving of this uh, dislocate this uh, loca you know um, dislocated to uh, to the north of the, the refugees. But uh, the one thing that Israel has to deal with, and uh, if they do not think about it now, we will find ourselves again in the same situation as we are being actually chased by the international community, not really achieving our strategic uh, objectives. And that is, as Jacques said, the day after. Because if we do not plan, if we do not install and think of some kind of a regime that will take care of Gaza, 
uh, not militarily. Israel will have to uh, right, take sure. uh, care of mil uh, military for the foreseeable future. But in terms of the humanitarian uh, aid uh, distribution, right. in terms of all the social activities, in terms of uh, um, anything that you can think of uh, in terms of governance. and. Uh, Right now, Netanyahu again has the the problem of Net, uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich that do not want, and he himself said he do not want to see right. Palestinian right. authority. There is nobody else who can do it, and unless and until Israel really thinks over who can effectively take right. over Gaza, we will be in this limbo which does not serve Israel's interests. All right. Well, we'll see if some decisions come out of the Security Cabinet today. Meanwhile, the IDF today concluded a large-scale military exercise in northern Israel amid the ongoing air attacks by Hezbollah and threats by Iran to launch a harsh retaliation for the strike that killed seven IRGC commanders in Damascus last week. Our reporter Shani Gedalia filed this report from northern Israel a short time ago. Tensions are still high in northern Israel. In the morning, a rocket alert sounded in several localities in Galilee. And later today, alerts sounded again after a suspicion of drone infiltration. It was in uh, Kiryat Shmona. So we see there are still many attacks from uh, Hezbollah to Israel on a daily basis. And in the light of uh, these attacks, the IDF completed yesterday an exercise with uh, the infantry, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, the police, and search and rescue units. The, the, the goal of this exercise was to increase readiness on the northern border. So uh, they simulated a number of potential attack scenarios. On the other hand, uh, on the other part, we know that Israel has been on high alert amid the, the Iranian threats, and uh, U.S. intelligence sources told CNN that Iran is unlikely to attack Israel directly and will instead ask its proxies in the region to launch attacks on its behalf in uh, the coming days. But in case Iran decides to launch a direct attack, Israel has signaled that it will attack it will attack targets in Iran, like Iranian nuclear facilities and other key infrastructure. Jacques, uh, last week uh, there was heightened concern, some might say hysteria over a possible Iran attack. Panic. Panic, panic uh, fueled in part by us in the media. Is it now time at least to sort of, to, for, not to relax, but to at least uh, be more calm about the prospect of a direct Iranian attack? I think we should, we should take the, the Iranian threats very seriously. Last time when this happened with Qasem Soleimani, it was on the 2nd of January 2020. It took the Iranians six days. On the 8th of January, they fired 100 missiles on the Ain al-Assad airbase, American airbase, and uh, there were lots of the, the, the damages right. done there, and the Americans had 300 uh, soldiers wounded, mo mostly deaf soldiers, right. because of the explosion. So we have to, uh, uh, we have to take uh, into consideration the fact that we are, in the next right. 48 hours, will be six days after what happened in Damascus. Okay, so stay on guard. Jacques Nerrier, Ambassador Daniel, stay with us. We're going out for a brief break, but we'll be right back with more the special broadcast of I-24 News, Day 186 of Israel's war against Hamas. Correspondence throughout the world brings the truth from Israel to hundreds of millions of people in scores of countries. Completely done down in their beds. De la frontière qui sépare Israël. The state of emergency and war in Israel. Bringing Israel's story to the world. I-24 News Channels. Now on Hot.
And the seagull was held captive for 51 days. Welcome back to this special broadcast on I-24 News. Israel's war against Hamas, day 186. Now, because of that war, relations between Israel and Turkey have drastically declined since October 7th and maybe reached or fell to a new level after Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has just announced new restrictions on exports to Israel, the first such economic sanctions imposed by Ankara. They've used diplomatic sanctions in the past. Israel Today told Erdogan that two nations can play at that game. More in this report from Ari 11 Waldman. Turkey, one of Hamas's key allies and one of Israel's biggest trade partners, has just cut off most exports to Israel. Turkey says the embargo will cover 54 categories of goods, including concrete, steel, and fuel, and says it's because Israel refused to let it carry out airdrops into Gaza. There is no excuse for Israel to block our attempt to airlift aid to the starving people of Gaza. Faced with this situation, we decided to take a series of new measures against Israel. These measures, approved by our president, will be implemented step by step without delay. Relations between the two countries have withered since the war with Hamas began after the terrorist slaughter of Israeli border communities on October 7th. But until now, trade hadn't been touched. Turkey is Israel's fifth biggest trade partner, exporting more than $7 billion worth of goods to Israel annually. Raw materials such as iron, steel and plastics taking up the majority of the list. We are not talking about like uh, very replaceable goods. Uh, we are talking about strategic goods like steel, uh, like marble and uh, cement. Uh, these are all uh, very much related to the construction sector. And uh, this is uh, something related with the national security uh, of the state of Israel. But the reasoning may be more political than diplomatic. Erdogan's party just lost a sweeping series of local elections because his traditional Islamist voter base didn't turn out. Many cited continued trade with Israel as the cause. It is very much related to the Turkish politics. During the whole election campaign, uh, Mr. Erdogan was attacked by the Turkish opposition, especially uh, by the uh, Islamist New Welfare Party, that uh, this particular party uh, asked Mr. Erdogan to put an end to all trade relations with Israel. Turkey maintains the embargo will continue as long as Israel fights in Gaza. But as many Israelis have abandoned Turkish products amidst souring relations, it's unlikely to ever recover. It's still with us in studio, Dr. Jacques Neri, Ambassador Danny Ayalon. But uh, first, I want to uh, go and speak with Ambassador Alon Liel, the former head of the Israeli diplomatic mission to Turkey, joining us this evening from the town of Herzliya. Uh, Ambassador Liel, thank you for joining us, Alon. I think in the past, when we've, we have talked about Israel's diplomatic differences uh, with Turkey, you've made the point that Erdogan always kept the economic connections going. He separated out diplomacy from from trade. So how serious is this step now uh, of taking economic sanctions of uh, Turkey against Israel? Uh, it's certainly serious. 
Um, it's civilian goods uh, that are under an agreement, a trade agreement, free trade agreement that we signed with Turkey in 1996. So it's against uh, all regulations, trade regulations. Uh, so it has a bilateral meaning uh, because the goods are uh, very important, especially to the construction business here. That is uh, sensitive in a sensitive situation now, but it has also a wider uh, meaning because uh, this can affect other countries. As far as I know, it's the first country that has diplomatic, full diplomatic relations with Israel that is uh, applying sanctions on civilian goods. Uh, some spoke on weapons, some spoke on, su on sanctions on settlers and settlements, but uh, I think it's the only one, it's the first one. Uh, Turkey definitely hopes that there will be more uh, following, but uh, bilaterally important and also uh, globally. Now, we know uh, it was really maybe economic concerns that fueled Erdogan's rapprochement with Israel looking maybe to join with Israel in, in exploiting that gas, natural gas in the eastern Mediterranean. Israel now says it's going to apply sanctions back on Turkey in response. Is that the proper way, you think, to deal with this situation, to strike Israel, for Israel to strike back at Turkey with its own uh, economic sanctions? Uh, one of the sad things here is that Erdogan did it because he feels that uh, Israel is much weaker than it was on the 6th of October, and its ability to respond also globally through the United States or through Europe or through uh, international organizations is minimal. The bilateral response is also not so meaningful because Erdogan has still things that he can go ahead with. And uh, if we will uh, revenge by limiting uh, Israeli goods to go to Turkey, he can still stop the oil, the Azerbaijanian oil, from coming to Israel because the pipeline is going through Turkey. So I'm not sure uh, an economic revenge from the Israeli side uh, will be much felt in Turkey, and I think it can trigger uh, further moves by Turkey. Right. One last question briefly. Do you think internal politics in Turkey is a factor here, as we said in our report? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, during the, the municipal elections, uh, right before, uh, the opposition demanded stopping the trade with Israel and even was critical on, for, on Erdogan for not doing so. Uh, he has the feeling somehow that one of the reasons for his defeat was that he didn't take such measures before the municipal elections. So he is doing it uh, now. I think it is a factor, but not as much as the feeling he has that Turkey does will not suffer any any uh, uh, reaction, international reaction, uh, as might have been a year or two ago when Israel had a different international standing. All right, Ambassador Alon Liel, thank you for joining us uh, on I-24 News. Danny, you have your own history of, of playing a role as, as Deputy Foreign Minister in previous diplomatic roles with Turkey. I'll pick up on something you could add, but I want to pick up on something alone said. Uh, shutting down the uh, oil pipeline from Azerbaijan would be a, a, a huge escalation. You really think Erdogan would, would, would go that far? I think if he goes that far, uh, that would mean that he will forego uh, Israel's uh, laying or uh, allowing the natural gas from our Mediterranean uh, stocks to Europe through Turkey. Actually, the rapprochement that uh, right started a few, you know, two years ago was exactly because he covets very much uh, to be involved with the gas. 
And uh, he knows that Israel has uh, alternatives, especially with Cyprus and, uh, and Greece. So if he takes such a strong measure, it will not hurt Israel because uh, today, you know, the, um, the free oil markets are, are pretty much uh, robust and right. uh, this, this is ex exchangeable. But he will risk actually uh, losing that uh, proposition that uh, I'm not sure that Israel should do it anyway, but he was still hoping. And uh, if he does that, for sure, we will go the, um, the, the Greek uh, route, which will be, I think, a, uh, a matter of uh, hurting uh, the, Ameri the right. uh, Turkish uh, economy. And there's, there's tens of billions of dollars, huge, huge amounts of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of money involved in that East Mediterranean gas. Now, Israel today unveiled a new line of defense against the missile and drone attacks launched by Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi rebels against the Red Sea resort of Alat. For the first time, the Israeli Navy deployed its Sea Dome defense system, its ship-based version of the Iron Dome, to shoot down a drone headed for Alat. It's the first known operational test of the Sea Dome after it was successfully uh, tested last year. More on this report from Dikshita Arvind. For the first time, an unmanned aerial vehicle, which was approaching Israel's southern city of Eilat, was successfully downed by the Israeli Defense Forces over the Red Sea. The drone was intercepted by a new system, the Sea Dome, launched from the Israeli Navy Sa'ar 6 class Corvette missile ship. The defense establishment continues all the time to upgrade the capabilities of the Iron Dome system on land and at sea in order to increase its effectiveness. In the current campaign, we successfully tested additional new capabilities for the system in its naval configuration on board the Sa'ar 6 ship, along with other layers of the multi-layered defense system layer of the State of Israel. Eilat has faced repeated ballistic missiles from the Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen as an act of solidarity with Hamas. Houthis have also launched a series of attacks targeting shipping in the Red Sea since the inception of Israel's operation in Gaza. Following the start of Israel's offensive in Gaza, Israel deployed missile boats in the Red Sea, one of which used the Sea Dome to intercept the drone. The Sea Dome uses the same interceptor as the land-based Iron Dome system, both engineered by the Israeli Defense Forces contractor Rafael. Using the same capabilities, linking the ship's systems to the systems on the land and the radar that was developed specifically for the task of protecting the economic waters, the system successfully identified the threats, rockets, UAVs and cruise missiles, and launched towards them from the heart of the sea, naval Iron Dome interceptors that destroyed them with perfect precision. The integration of the Sea Dome in tandem with the Aero, the aerial anti-missile system and the Iron Dome ensures Israel's comprehensive defense system across all domains, land, sea, and air. Jacques, the Sea Dome proved its worth in the, in the field uh, today. Uh, uh, Israel has a defense against the Houthis. And we, by the way, we also see a decrease in their attacks on shipping through uh, the European effort, the Speedies, I think it's called. Uh, is the Houthis threat diminishing? Uh, the Houthis threat uh, has, has proven to be a failure. I mean, fi finally, I mean, except for one ship that has sunk, all the rest right. have been hit, or uh, those who were hit were not uh, were not sunk. And I think that the coalition, the European and American coalition, is very successful in, in thwarting all the, the Houthis' attacks, and they are just uh, right now the, uh, uh, t uh, targeting and aiming installation inside the, inside Yemen, which is very, uh, it seems to be very operational and very successful. Uh, by the way, the, the same SARS six was almost hit uh, a week ago by the, the drone that was sent from Iraq right. and uh, and hit the naval base of Eilat. Uh, and another thing is that the Iron Dome is put on other platform. It's not the only platform that is being adapted to the, to fight them I mean, in the sea. We have others also, the, uh, I mean, strategic ones right. that, are the, that, that are being developed and are being also operational. And I think that this is a good thing because, I mean, the, installing such a system on the, on the SAR-6 has saved billions of dollars of, uh, uh, of development. Right, and of course extends Israel's defense capability much further beyond, beyond, its, beyond its borders. So uh, that's uh, certainly, as I said, passing the test today. Let's go now to the U.S., where Israel's battle against Hamas seems to be steadily losing support among leading political figures 
in the Democratic Party, as some Republicans, including Donald Trump, look to take advantage of that trend by using the Hamas war as a wedge issue in this campaign season. For more, let's go to our senior U.S. correspondent, Mike Wagenheim in uh, New York. And Mike, uh, some of those things, I'm thinking of comments made by, uh, reportedly by Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, got to, should be certainly be raising some concerns among Israel supporters there in the U.S. and I think here too. Warren has generally taken, I don't know if it's an anti-Israel bent all the time, but certainly has not been a staunch ally of Israel. So her comments today in a Senate hearing where she said she believes it will play out, uh, that uh, it will uh, uh, be proven that Israel has committed genocide in, uh, in Gaza, I think is of less concern than some of the more not only middle of the road, but pro-Israel uh, traditionally Democrats uh, that have been making comments uh, about possibly conditioning aid. Uh, we heard today from Gregory Meeks, the uh, top Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, again, a, just a staunch pro-Israel ally. Uh, he represents a district in Queens, uh, not far from where we are here, uh, rarely has gone against Israel in any measure, in any vote, uh, saying today that he's flying back to Washington uh, to get more information in a, in a special briefing about whether uh, the United States should sell weaponry uh, to Israel that the Biden administration has proposed, including 50 F-15s, a fairly large weapons package. So he said, uh, you know, he wants to know whether it's going to be used for, quote unquote, more death, uh, whether it will be used to uh, impact humanitarian aid uh, going into Gaza, wants to see, uh, make sure that it uh, won't lead to a possible longer holding of the hostages there or impair a possible two-state solution. This is it's Gregory Meeks, again, not one you would look at for possibly withholding uh, uh, weapons uh, to Israel. Tim Kaine, who was Hillary Clinton's vice presidential candidate uh, partner back in 2016, uh, talked uh, this weekend about potentially withholding aid. Nancy Pelosi went on a, a cable station earlier on today and uh, blasted uh, Benjamin Netanyahu specifically and said he's a tragedy and uh, the way the war is being uh, conducted right now is not doing any good for Israel, more of a personal attack. Nevertheless, to see Nancy Pelosi, who quotes uh, Enli uh, Eretz uh, Eret every other second, uh, going against Israel in this way is, is quite concerning. Uh, so it, it's these traditional staunch Democratic allies of Israel that uh, are more worry, worrisome right now than the Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warrens of the world. Right. And as I mentioned, some Republicans, including President Trump, who said this before, that uh, uh, American Jews that vote for for Joe Biden are, uh, are, are showing there the fact they have no cons real concern for Israel, are looking to see this as an issue. Maybe they think they'll pick up some, some, some Jewish votes uh, in the U.S.? I don't think Donald Trump threatening anybody with a stern talking to over their uh, support of uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats is going to win anybody over. I think the, the Jewish vote is kind of, um, you know, played out as it is right now in terms of uh, who's in, in which camp. And I think it's been that way for quite some time. I think the longer term concern not only is a, uh, the lack of a bipartisan uh, agreement on Israel related issues, which we're seeing play out more and more within the halls of Congress. I, I think there's no coherent policy right now, even on Trump, uh, who, you know, in his four years of office, I don't whether you agree with his policies or not, he was staunchly pro-Israel in his policies, but everything with Trump plays out on a personal level. Right. What if he has a complication again with Benjamin Netanyahu? What if Yair Lapid or Benny Gantz are in office who tend to sway more to the left in their relationships with Democrats? How will that play out? So there's no safe play right now uh, for Jews on either side of the aisle, I think, uh, when it comes to uh, the presidential election upcoming. All right. Uh, certainly it's developing that way. Mike Wagenheim in New York, thank you for that. Danny, early in the week, I asked, I told Michael Lauren, uh, there must be some times when you're happy you're no longer the ambassador in Washington. This is a challenging time for Israel, uh, uh, certainly close to the baby since I, I remember. Uh, and the question is, what should Israel be doing more to try to reverse some of the trends, at least on the diplomatic front? Sure. Well, first and foremost, I think we should show the, I would say, the more pleasant side of Israel in terms of uh, personal relationships between Israeli leaders and American leaders. I think that will play a long, uh, I would say, uh, way in terms of getting some more uh, support or sympathy. But I'll tell you, this has never been so bad because uh, uh, the aid, the, um, the military aid right. of the United States has been sacrosanct until this uh, war in Gaza. The fact that we see more and more people 
from the mainstream, not the progressive, not the leftist, not the anti-Israel, which I know, which we know were declared ones, like Warren and uh, Sandy and uh, Bernie Sanders, but other mainstream. The fact that they are bringing up the issue of uh, um, uh, embargo, Defense aid and Def all, yeah, right. And, and this is very dangerous because it is a slippery slope. I don't think that we will see it coming imminently, but once the genie is out of the bottle, it can be played out any time in the future. All right. Well, we've spoken a couple of times this evening about the, the possibility or the concern over uh, international opposition to Israel's war in Gaza, le uh, leading, at the very minimum now, to public discussion of the likes we haven't heard before of limiting arms sales uh, to Israel, even in political circles in the United States and also in Germany. These are the two leading foreign suppliers of defense products to Jerusalem. In fact, uh, the U.S. accounts for 69 percent of arms supplies to Israel and Germany to 30 percent. A mandate set down in the 2016 Memorandum of Understanding promised a total of $676 billion. I think we have some visuals on this of U.S. military aid over 10 years. Germany's arms sales to Israel totaled $326.5 million, uh, mainly for air defense systems and communications equipment. Now, at The Hague in the Netherlands today, German officials responded strongly to accusations made by Nicaragua's leftist government that charging Berlin with facilitating what it characterizes as Israel's campaign of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. Here's what the legal advisor to German's foreign ministry had to say after today's hearing at the IJC. Unlike Nicaragua, we are striving to do justice to both parties to the conflict. We are guided by respect for international law, responsibility for the security of Israel, respect for the suffering of the Palestinian population in Gaza, efforts to free the Israeli hostages, as well as by the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination in the context of a two-state solution. We have stated that we will reject Nicaragua's unfounded accusations, and there is no reason for the ICJ to adopt provisional measures. Well, from all, let's go to Berlin and speak with uh, journalist and political analyst James Jackson. And James, how is this being taken now uh, in Germany? Uh, the irony, of course, from our perspective in Israel, to see Germany being accused of abetting genocide in helping Jews defend itself as opposed to committing genocide against uh, the Jewish people? Well, of course, the Genocide Convention was set up after the Second World War by a Polish Jew, Raphael Lemkin, who wanted to see people on trial for committing genocide against the Jews. So there is a, a certain historical irony about, about this case. However, I think that also makes it slightly painful or even just awkward for many Germans to see themselves effectively on trial for genocide again, but this time for supporting the Jews, or rather uh, the state of Israel, the Jewish state, uh, instead of um, for committing the Holocaust. And I think that's why they made one of their arguments today, which um, was that one of their principal arguments was that the support for um, Israel came from Germany's responsibilities from its history. However, some would also say, critics might argue, that Germany has should have learned a responsibility for all of humanity, especially the Jews, and not just for defending the Jewish state. It's a big political discussion that has been taking place in Germany. In the meantime, the German public have changed their opinion and are backing a ceasefire by a large majority, with eight out of ten now wanting Israel uh, Israel to stop. Um, six nine percent or. And, want an immediate ceasefire, and 8 out of 10 want Germany to put pressure on Israel. So we've seen a noted change in senior politicians. Previously, these were activists on the street, many of them Palestinian themselves or pro-Palestinian. But I do think that the center of society has taken a more critical line towards Israel. That, of course, does not mean that they support Nicaragua's accusation of genocide or that uh, that will go through in the court in the preliminary measures or towards the final ruling of the ICJ. Right, or that it would translate into, for example, limiting arms sales, at least not perhaps in the present government. James Jackson, uh, thank you for that. But, Jacques, this is disturbing because, uh, as James has said, there, we're seeing a shift 
in Germany. It's something we saw, I think, a little earlier in France, which started out very staunchly on Israel, uh, Emmanuel Macron certainly, growing public opposition, and then in the shift. Uh, in fact, Macron joining with two Arab leaders now uh, well, in the Wall Street Journal, quite a ceasefire. But of course, Germany, as a strategic partner, much more important uh, to Israel than, for example, than I'd say any uh, other France, country in Europe. Uh, well, you know, I'm not surprised, I mean, uh, about France. I mean, I, I've served three years in France, and I fought the, the French administration because of that uh, that uh, re remnants of Gaulism inside uh, the the, uh, the the French uh, uh, the establishment. They they still uh, they still looked at Israel as the goal used to look at, at us. I mean, and th this is th this doesn't surprise me that Macron has turned back again to those uh, very dark days of, of France concerning Israel. As far as Germany, Germany is very important for Israel. I mean, it just remember that the strategic arm of Israel, the submarines are being built by Germans and this is, and they are being financed mostly by Germans and this is an, uh, of utmost importance and uh, I mean paramount importance uh, uh, and we have to uh, to safeguard all our relations with Germany and continue to nourish uh, th this special relationship otherwise I mean uh, hurting and harming this uh, the, this uh, this venue of, of weapons from Germany is very could be very dangerous for Israel. Right. And again, I'm going to throw the question back to you on the on the diplomatic front, uh, Danny. I mean, Germany, it's a different case uh, than the U.S. In the U.S., you have uh, a solid base of support among uh, certainly the American Jewish community or the majority, I would say, of the American Jewish community and supporters of Israel. There are other groups that are, are uh, the evangelicals. Germany, it's a different case. Uh, really, it's really been more government to government there. What can, what should this government be doing diplomatically to make sure that that flow, that, uh, that that security relationship for Germany, so crucial, as Jacques said, the submarines that are being built, that that relationship is maintained? Right. Well, I think what Israel should do uh, more is to explain that we are on the same team, you know, with the Western countries, including France and Germany, for sure, and the United States. And uh, the explanation should be that uh, the war indeed is in Gaza, but the battle is global. And we see here actually two, uh, two camps, the American-led camp with the Western countries and the Russian-China-Iran camp. And this is where I think Germans and uh, French and other Europeans do feel in their heart of hearts that they should be with us because Israel is the stopgap against a, uh, a deluge of uh, Islamists over to the, uh, to the continent. If you look at the map, you know, you see the vast right. uh, uh, Middle East and little Israel is like the, uh, uh, you know, like the little boy who stops the flood. So uh, their interest lies with us. But what we see really here, and Germany is quite capable to defend itself against allegations like from Nicaragua. Right. It's, it's more of a symbolic it's thing. It's symbolic. And what we see here is that actually it's Iran who is behind everything. It's a political war. The Iranians understand that there were no um, achievements on the battleground from Hamas or Hezbollah mm -hmm. or the Houthis. And they're trying every dirty trick in the book to discomfit, to de condemn Israel, and to use others like South Africa. You know, they gave billions of dollars right. to South Africa to sue right. us at the ICJ. And Nicaragua, like Venezuela, is a, a Latin American same, country yeah. that has link, you know, links with with Iran, and the, the, there are all, similarities. All those leftist uh, regimes but, in South Africa are against but, us. between between the governments there. I want to thank uh, Dr. Jacques Nerrier, Ambassador.